Hi there, Prof here. Welcome to C++ 101. In this episode, we are going to learn about data types and variables. If you haven't watched the previous episode on the part of C++ program, then I will encourage you to pause this video and watch that one first. Okay, let's get started. Assuming I assign you the task to create a form with the following data, name, gender, age, height, telephone number, email address, and address. There are so many ways you can do this to create very fancy forms. You can have a form that looks like this with a lot of space for each field. But assuming I impose a constraint on space to use, such that you only have a limited amount of space to work with, then you will have to be careful about how much space you assign to each field. In such a situation, you are likely to produce a form that looks like this one. This form is very efficient in space usage. Gender, age, and height of a person do not require so much space to write, unless the person's default handwriting is size 36 point. So, Stacking these three fields on the same line and allocating just enough space is a good thing to do. From my introduction to computer episode, and once again, if you haven't watched that, please pause and go and watch it. In that video, I said that before any program can be executed, it has to be loaded into the memory. The same applies to data. Before we can manipulate any data, it has to be loaded into the memory. Now, let's assume that the program we are writing has access to all the available memory installed on the computer system. The computer memory, if we recall from our first episode, is made up of fixed number of cells, each having a size of one byte. So, for a computer with a one kilobyte memory, it has 1024 bytes of memory cells. Each cell can take 8 bits of data, so approximately a 1 kilobyte memory can hold up to 1000 ASCII characters. You may not be familiar with such smaller memories today since even little computers come equipped with gigabytes of memories installed in them. However, if you are into embedded systems, then you will see these things often. Let's take Atmega 328P microcontroller for instance. That is the microcontroller on Arduino Uno and Nanobot, and also a Retrino. They have just a 2 kilobyte memory, and in such a memory constrained environment, you do not have the liberty to write fancy memory intensive programs. Learning how to manage your memory usage is very important in programming, whether you have memory in abundance or not. However, in some programs, there is always a trade off and we will do as such when it comes to that but for now we are going to learn to be responsible for the amount of memory we use to properly assign the right amount of space for storage in memory c++ provides us with data types data types do not only help the computer to assign the right amount of memory space but it also contains information about the kind of operation that can be performed on a given data for instance, if a given data is an integer, then it can be multiplied, added, and divided, etc. But if a given data is a string data type, like the name of a person, then multiplying it by 2 does not make sense. Hence, the computer will not be allowed to do that. Also, because of a concept known as overloading, which I will talk about in later episodes, new definitions can be assigned to operators. For instance, Addition naturally adds two numbers and give the result. But if you perform addition on two strings, for instance, if I pick the name, the word Eric and the word Aubin and do Eric plus Aubin, it is going to perform an operation called concatenation, which in essence is going to join the two strings together. C++ provides us with seven fundamental data types. We have the Boolean, character, integer, floating point number, double floating point number, valueless, and wide character. And these are the key words that are used to um, refer to them in code. 
These are also called built-in or primitive data types. Some of these data types can be modified using these modifiers, short, long, signed, and unsigned. Appending these modifiers modifies the nature of the data type. Let's look at this sample program. But before that, please take note that the amount of space allocated for each data type is also compiler and operating system dependent. So when I run this program, what it's going to do is tell me uh, how much memory is allocated to these data types uh, per my operating system and computer. There is a link to get access to the source code. So if you're online, you can down, follow it and download. However, if you are using the video offline, then maybe you just have to take your time and write it. And it's good for your muscles. Okay, so let's run the program and see. Okay, so here I have a table. We have data type, keyword, um, that's the keyword used to represent the data type, the size in bytes, and the range of values that it accepts. So we have Boolean data type, its keyword is bool, and you can see that on my system, it is represented by one byte, and chances are that it is going to be one byte on almost every system. Now, this one byte of data means that it can accept values from minus 128 to positive 127, okay? Now, what happens is that any number apart from zero, whether negative or positive, is a Boolean true or is represented as a true, a true value. No, Booleans are true or false values, okay? So, any number that is not zero, so minus 128 is true, 127 is true, positive 3 is true, minus 3 is true except zero. Zero is the only number in this range that is taken as false. If we take the character data type, its keyword is car and it also has just one byte of memory space. However, sorry for the negative value here, but characters ranges from zero up to 255. The way you calculate this is to raise two to the power the number of bits and the number of bytes. I'll show you that calculation later. Now, if you take integers, for instance, integers on my system take four bytes. That means that they can accept values within this range. It's a very huge value in the same billion. Then, if we take short int, short int takes two bytes of memory and so it will accept any value within this range. Long int also takes four bytes and it also accepts values within this range. So come to think of it, if I haven't made any mistake in my program, let me check. If I haven't made any mistake, which of course I haven't, then you can see that long int and short int are having the same memory size. So the question is why? Okay, so I'll find out later. Floating points are used to represent numbers with decimal points. Okay, and just ordinary floating point numbers also occupy four. Uh, four memory, uh, four bytes of memory space. Now, when it comes to floating points, we are more interested in precision, and by precision, we, we are talking about how many decimal places it can contain. Because if you have a value to three decimal places, then there are more errors compared to the same value to maybe ten decimal places. Now, if you take the double floating point, which is whose keyword is double, it occupies eight bytes. So you can see that the amount of it has a higher precision compared to the ordinary floating point. Okay, and even to make it better, we have long double, which occupies 16 bytes of data. So here, when you are doing some serious scientific computations where you need a lot of accuracy then you have to consider using the long double because it can give you a very 
accurate values compared to double and floating point then we also have white characters white characters make room for um chinese characters japanese characters and all those other characters okay now typically character here is mainly in the ascii and a few symbolic characters but then it doesn't even support chinese and japanese handwriting so using white characters gives you this range of values and again that means that it can support a lot a very wide range of characters almost every character in every language on earth okay so some of these data types can be modified using modifiers and the modifiers i'm talking about are signed unsigned short and long we've already seen short and long you can see that when we append um short to an end instead of four byte it takes two byte but when we are paying long to an end instead of four byte it takes eight byte so that that is the kind of modification i'm trying to talk about here but then integers and floating points by default have or accept negative numbers okay so you see this range we can insist that the computer should only allow positive numbers okay so that is to say that by default these integers and floating point numbers are signed that means they can accept both positive and negative numbers but the moment we use unsigned modifier with them then it means that we don't want them to accept negative this the negative range of values that means that we are pushing okay so we will force this negative value to start from zero and then the whole range will now shift to the positive zone so that means we are going to have this times two is that okay so you can also do that when you rather need a much bigger positive value and you don't care about using negative values then you can set use the unsigned modifier on your variables but take note not every data type can accept it it is only the numbers integers and floating point numbers okay so let's look at the character for instance inside this program i'm going to generate we said that characters start from zero up to 255 okay now what happens is you know um the normal english letters they belong to the ascii characters okay and ascii the maximum number uh, in terms of base 10 numerals is 127 okay good so all the letters in the english alphabet are represented by certain numbers which we call the ascii codes so i'm going to generate those codes so that we go through so let's start from the very first one you can see that right from zero up to about 31 um we have this square ball uh, rectangular or square box whatever you want to call it and a question mark now what this means is that the computer doesn't understand what those characters are okay now let's go and look at this this is an ascii table now you can see that right from zero through 31 those characters are all commands they are not data they are commands so we have zero as a null character we have start of heading start of text these things are commands they are commands okay so for instance when i press the escape key there is a command corresponding to that when i press enter there is a command corresponding to that and all that okay so the first 32 um values of the ascii table represent commands to the computer is that okay so when we press backspace enter shift control alt those command keys they are associated with the first 32 ascii characters now ascii character ascii value 32 corresponds to space so when i hit the space bar the computer is seeing ascii number 32 is that okay all right so let's go back to the program 
So over here, I'm displaying the base 10 numeral, the ASCII, the corresponding character in the ASCII code. Is that okay? All right, so let's jump to space. So ASCII number 32, you can see that there is nothing here because it represents space. And that is the um, binary code for a space. The next one is exclamation sign. So you can see that from 32, all these, they represent some symbols on our keyboard. Okay. Then we get, we come to ASCII letters, uh, ASCII character zero. So we have the numeric session zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, corresponding to ASCII, ASCII values 48 through 57. And these are their corresponding binary codes. Then we have another set of symbols. Then we start with the capital letters. So ASCII letter A actually corresponds to the value 65 and this is the binary code so that is how characters are treated and you can see over here we have the smaller or lower caps versions of the capital letters is that okay so characters are treated as ascii values and they are internally represented by numbers so it's something that is very essential C++ allow you to assign new names to existing data types using the type def declaration. For instance, if by whatever means you want to change, let's say, int to yard, then the way you do this is to begin with the type def keyword, followed by the type you want to change and the new name you want to assign. So, for instance, here we start with type def int which is the type we want to change and the new name we want to assign to yard. so instead of int distance equals to 10 now we can do yard distance equal to 10 it's pretty fun you can try it out that is enough about data types so now the question is how do we use data types in c plus plus a typical usage is in the creation of variables. A variable is a named or allocated memory space. A variable has a symbolic name and can be assigned any value allowed by the defined data type. Creating variables in C++ is very simple. All you need is to specify the data type and the name of the variable. This is called variable declaration. So this is the syntax. We start with the type or the data type and the name you want to assign. So example, we have int and we have age. The name is how you, the programmer, wants to refer to the variable in code. The name of the variable is also known as identifier and it is case sensitive. I will talk about this in a moment. The name of the name you choose for your identifiers benefit the computer in no way. Behind the scene, the computer associates the variable name to the memory location of that variable. So it's like referencing a geographical location by name. Let's say Ghana, Adum, or USA, Washington, DC. These places have GPS coordinates which rightly pinpoint the exact location. However, Keeping GPS co locations or coordinates in our head is not fun. So we like to assign fancy names to places for easy identification. The same applies to variable names. Now let's look at a demonstration in the program. So in the program, I've created two variables, age and gender. Okay, so whenever I call age, this is what the computer sees, 0x70fe0c, which represents the hexadecimal notation for the particular memory address. The same way when I call out gender, this is what the computer sees, okay? So take uh, this, keeping distance in your head is not fun, but the computer is able to bundle these horrible values here to this fancy name so that it makes life easier. So, why do we want to create variables? After creating variables, we have to store data in it. Setting a value to a variable is called assignment. It is 
performed by the assignment operator which has the symbol of the equal sign. Performing this operation sets a value to that memory location. Remember that you don't need to specify the type, the data type, when you are setting a value to the variable. It is like a naming ceremony. The very first time a baby is assigned a name, Mary is made. However, afterwards, nobody makes Mary to call the baby. So the variable declaration is like the naming ceremony. It is done once. Once a variable has been declared, its value can be changed many times. The statement that assigns a value to a variable is called an assignment statement. The declaration and initialization process can be done at once. And um, initialization actually is a term used to um, denote or to, to tell the very first time a value was assigned to a variable. And this is how you do it. So you, you, you use... You use the variable name, the assignment operator, and the value you want to assign to it, followed by a semicolon. So for instance, we made our declaration here, we created the variable, and over here we are initializing the variable. Is that okay? Good. However, this, this declaration and initialization steps can be combined. Okay, so we can do it in a one step process by specifying the data type, the name and the value. So for instance, int age equals to 18. Is that okay? Good. Whenever a new value is assigned to a variable, it overwrites the previous value. This is the default behavior of the memory. So for instance, over here, I have assigned 18 to age. Now, if I come down and do a new assignment and set 18 to uh, set age to 24, for instance, then the 18 which was previously entered would be overwritten and the new one 24 would be stored. Now, sometimes you do not want the value of a variable once set to change. For instance, let's say you are writing a program to compute the area of a circle. Now, the area of a circle is given by pi r squared. Pi here is a constant value. That means it doesn't have to change ever. So if we create a variable to represent pi, then chances are that we don't want this value to change. Now, C++ gives you a means of doing that. All you have to do is to modify the declaration statement with the keyword const now it doesn't matter whether you bring it first or in between but it should assume one of these positions now the moment you do this the c plus like the compiler will prevent you from reassigning or changing the value of this variable naming variables or identifiers has some rules let's look at the rules Variable names in C++ can range from 1 to 255 characters. To make variable names portable to other environments, stay within a maximum of 1 to 30 characters. I don't know what on earth would make you name a variable as long as 255 characters. Always try to make your variable names descriptive and simple okay not something that anytime you want to use you have to scroll up or down to go and refer what name did you use now all variable names must begin with a letter of the alphabet or an underscore and uh, if you don't know an underscore that's that's an underscore for beginning programmers it may be easier to begin all variable names with a letter of the alphabet after the first initial letters, variable names can also contain letters and numbers. No spaces or special characters, however, are allowed. Now, uppercase characters are distinct from lowercase characters. So, for instance, if I write my age, it is different from my age all in caps. In fact, all these my ages are different so far as C++ is concerned. Using all uppercase letters 
is primarily used to identify constant variables in code so it's a convention that we do if if you append the const keyword as as we have here to a variable that's in order to create a constant value then c plus has conventions that is something that the community does is to type all the name in caps so that the moment you see it you know that oh wow that is a constant value and again you cannot use any c plus plus keyword also known as reserved words as a variable name among c plus plus community there is a convention known as the camel case okay that looks like this or like that okay you see the way the camel looks like the head is small with a bigger body so in the camel case any the, the variable names begin with a small letter however any word that is any word within the name should begin with a capital letter all right thank you for watching i hope this helps i will be very interested if you could send me your comments and suggestions via an email that i will display at the end of this episode if you are interested in learning electronics then check out my electronics 101 tutorials on this same channel don't forget to share and subscribe to this channel once again i am prof and versus tech founder